I really enjoy Scout Sunday. It's a lot of fun, but it also gives me a moment on a Sunday morning when typically my head is very fixed here and now to fondly remember my own experience of growing up in Boy Scouts. I really en enjoyed it very, very much. And there are still things about it that I remember, uh, a lot of skills that I learned, uh, but there are some things that I don't quite remember and I had to look up again. I really challenged myself this morning on the drive in to see if I could remember all 12 points of the Scout Law. There were some that I missed and I chose not to read too deeply into that. <laughs> but I had to jog my memory when I got in to remind myself that the 12 points of the Boy Scout Law, that a Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. I got most of those on the way in. I remembered reverent at the end, and then I got a few before that. They are wonderful qualities, tremendous virtues, each and every one of them, and I think that you could probably spend an entire life, or at least an entire career in scouting, working on embodying just one of them, and there are 12 of them in total. When I was a Boy Scout, um, I remember sitting in one of those first meetings after having come up through Cub Scouts and sitting in the uh, fire department of North Windham in my hometown and hearing all of the older scouts reciting the scout law and reading it there on paper in front of me and feeling a little bit overwhelmed because they are very lofty things. They are, they really, really are. I honestly wondered if I was capable of getting near any of them, nonetheless all 12 of them at once, which is what I thought the assignment was. <laughs> it didn't feel necessarily like a burden, but it felt like a very high bar to hit all 12 of them. In our scripture this morning, when Matthew writes about the kingdom of heaven, he speaks, he writes in a dreamy, hopeful spirit, yearning, looking out somewhere in the middle distance at something which is not quite yet, and yet the image before him is so clear, he can shape it with his hands, he can draw it out and color it in and write it down on miles and miles and miles of scroll describing it to us. And this is because this thing that he sees, the kingdom that he has caught a glimpse of, is such a mighty and majestic thing, a holy and powerful thing, world-changing thing, that he gathers us all excitedly around the parables of Jesus to hear of this glorious time, this glorious time when the justice and mercy and love of God will come to govern in every human heart and mind, a time when suffering shall cease, when oppressions shall lift, when bigotry and hatred and evil shall dissolve, and each and every one of the children of this blessed creation, that's you and me and everyone we know, that we will all have all that we need, material and spiritual, to build and live, and then in good time leave a life worth living. That's it. That's all it is. Don't stress out about it. That's all the kingdom of heaven is. Just the complete undoing and tearing down of every single structure in our societies that anchors the human soul and tarnishes, tarnishes the universal dignity of everyone. That's it. Don't worry about it. It's pretty lofty, I think. It's a pretty lofty thing, chasing after the kingdom of heaven, kind of like chasing after 12 points of the scout law. And I wonder, though, as we sit with this incredible thing we are to bring about in the world, according to Matthew and Jesus, and we think about the 12 points here, if there's actually maybe something that we can learn from the Boy Scouts here, my fellow Christians, something about chasing after this kingdom, because there is something about the 12 points. I think we are all familiar that in scouting, you earn these things called merit badges, that you work toward them, and then when you have achieved a certain level of accomplishment, you get a badge for it. Did you know that there isn't a bravery merit badge? Did you know that there isn't a cleanliness merit badge or a, a reverence merit badge? 
that the BSA does not say to a scout at a certain point in their career, thank you, you've done it. You have accomplished reverence. You may move on to the next one now. <laughs> because it's something that they know and something that Matthew knows too, and it's written in between the lines of his verses. And it is not subtle, but it is there and is worth saying out loud. It is a few different things. The first thing is one, that the kingdom of heaven, well, it is a job. It is a task, and it is our task to do. It does not belong to someone else. We are the ones to do it. It is sitting in our inbox, and it belongs to us, to humanity to do, because, too, despite the nomenclature, the kingdom of heaven is not waiting up there after we die. It is not waiting for us behind the pearly gates, but it is something that wants to come about through us in our lives. It is not a place, but a state of being that for all meaningful purposes can only exist here. Between us, among us, on planet Earth, among peoples and tribes and nations as we live and breathe, it is not a land that we enter, but a responsibility that we choose to take on. And oof. It is a big responsibility. I will not deny that. It is a big one. However, take heart because though it is not something we can accomplish and finish, it is a responsibility that we have. It is one that we are meant to forever be stepping toward. The kingdom of heaven is not something that we can seize and accomplish, call done, and move on. Because in truth, it doesn't need that from us. Because as, the pure, as the, these parables teach, the kingdom of heaven, it actually has already come. Did you not know that? That the kingdom of heaven has already come, is already here? It does not need us to create it. The yeast has already been mixed in with the flour. The seed shall sprout and grow on its own. The field has already been planted. Not only has the kingdom already come and already here, but it's occurring. It's coming into fullness is only aided by our involvement, not dependent upon it. With careful and thoughtful tending, the garden will grow fuller and gain and yield more grain. With proper trimming and cultivating, the mustard plant will grow its gigantic spread of branches. And with an experienced eye, the dough will turn expertly into bread and feed many. And without us there? Well, the truth is, in time, the seed would take root. The birds would make their nests. The dough will still rise and rise and rise and rise. When we are called into the work of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is inviting us close right into the already natural becoming of the kingdom in order to cultivate it into something that we can share in and pass down to the generations after us. Goodness is everywhere. Reverence is everywhere. Bravery is everywhere. Our job is to accept the responsibility of living it out in our lives. We could, as we often do, sit back and watch the rooting, the growing, the rising, and that is good that it does not need us, but we, people of faith and of substance and of conviction and vision, are instructed to step in a little bit closer and get to work, to put on our gloves, get into the dirt, to rake away the litter and to fertilize the ground, to take off our rings and knead the dough, because finally, and this is the last one, we are more than simply recipients of the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. We are not simply to have it. We are called to give it, to deliver it to others, to each other, in this beautiful spiritual generational daisy chain, wherein with one hand we receive from one, and the other hand we offer to the next. It's hard work. It's good work. It's lifelong work. And that this is the way it has always worked. Knowing truly this vision of a future, a world where it all can be freer, where we all can be fuller, where the acceptance and justice of all can be for everyone if we now, here, 
choose to claim the responsibility of making it so.